Oh, would you look at the time. It's pod o'clock. Hello and welcome to In The Pockets, the bass guitar podcast where we get the lowdown on the low end. Uh, Oh, it sounds weird doing it in a different rhythm. I don't like it. Uh, My name's Johnny, a totally average bass player, and each week I'm joined by a different co-host to talk all about that bass. Bit of a a switch around this week. Uh, No co-host today. We had a bit of a scheduling change-up, so things like that. So we have got guests in the chamber. But uh, yeah, just me this time, and then back to it again uh, next week. Um, So yeah, it's been a week. (laughs) It's been a week. (laughs) Um, It's been a week of, you know, some some great stuff for the the channel, if you follow me on YouTube. Um, We've just hit a million views, which is really cool. Um, And I've just hit 2,000 followers on Instagram, uh, at Johnny Dibble. Go and follow me on there. Let's get it up to even more. Um, Yeah, I'm feeling very grateful recently. Like, people have been getting involved. I've been absolutely loving having conversations with people online. And, like, that's honestly my favorite thing about all of this. So reach out to me on Instagram. Let's, Let's strike up a conversation about all things base because... That's my passion. That's your passion. Let's share our passions. Um, that didn't mean to sound quite as sexual as it did, but oh well. Let's let's do that, shall we? Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for for all the support, and let's keep climbing to ten thousand subscribers. Woo-hoo. Let's jump straight in to our first question. <laughs> The first question of the week comes from Jinji. It's a lot of eyes on the end. Um, on Instagram, who asks why are popular bands constricted to only one bassist? Um, well, I now correct me if I'm wrong, and please shout at me in the comments or not shout at me, just make some recommendations because I I don't know if I know any non-popular bands that that have two bass players i know there's a couple of you know artists that are just it's just like two bass players and then like some beats behind them and they're like both on ding walls i can't remember what they're called but that they're, they're insane um but um yeah why are popular bands constricted to only one bass player honestly i think you only really need one i think people have probably tried having two before and it just starts to sound a bit farty um, because you're kind of in the same register. Now, that's not to say that one could be doing low down, one could be doing high up, but I, I just don't think it sounds that great. I don't think two basses complement each other that well. Um, guitars, bass, drums, they all have a purpose and the bass has a purpose in a, in a mix and in a band. Whereas if you've got two, you're kind of not using the bass for its purpose, which you know, it's all subjective. There's there's nothing wrong with not doing something that you're meant to do, you know. Um, but yeah, if you're both down playing low, it just sounds a bit farty and, and you're, you know, you're maxing out those frequencies big time. Um, so I don't really like that sound. But the other thing as well, now I watch a lot of Anderton's, uh, the YouTube channel and the shop here in England. Um, I watch their YouTube channel, of course. It's, a, it's amazing, and they're all great. Um, and I love, and I love uh, the the bass. I love the all about the bass part as well. But when, but when they're like playing the intros and doing two basses off one another, it always it always nigg- I have a little niggle with that because I'm like. Oh, it's oh, it it just doesn't sound that great. Or like, oh, don't get me wrong, they sound incredible at playing. They are much better players than I will ever be. But when it's like two basses going off at the same time, I'm like, which one is sounding like what? Who's playing what? It's, I don't. Uh, oh, oh. It. I don't think it really works that well when you're playing two basses off of one another. Um, and that's when they're playing in two, like one's high up playing a lead line and one's low down. So, um, yeah, I. I just think that there isn't really that much of a market for it. Um, and like the 
the function of a bass in mainstream music and popular music. It doesn't really, you don't really need it. So yeah, I, I think that is why. Um, but hell, I'm I'm happy to be proven wrong. And and this isn't to say like that's two normal basses, you know. You could have a bass and a bass six. That's totally normal. It's, it's a different, although it's an octave lower than guitar, it's a different sounding bass, you know. It doesn't really sound like a normal bass. And I don't think it's a substitute for a normal bass. Um, so you could go down that route. So that could be the, the caveat in this question that gets that gets you through it. Um, but yes, uh why are popular bands constricted to only one bassist? Because we only need one. And we don't, let's be honest, like, I would not want another bass player in my band. I, I don't want to compete. I'm ba I'm average enough as it is, you know. Not having someone else show me up who's amazing. Um, yeah, so I think it's just uh, it's just our big-headedness, really. That means that we, we can be the only one and have no one else. Thank you so much for the question. Let's uh, move on to the news. Oh my goodness, it's it's a very busy news week. So we could make this the big base debate, honestly, because there's a lot of stuff to unpack here. Because, like I said, it's it's. Pretty much we're still in the start of the new year, you know, it's only February now. And with NAM not happening, brands are still releasing all of their new gear, which has got me very excited. And I was excited and a bit annoyed because Squire decided to launch their brand new 40th anniversary range in guitars and basses like the day before the last podcast went out and I'd already recorded it and didn't have time to go back and add that into the news section. So this is actually pretty old news now, but can't not cover it. Are you mad? Ugh, so excited. So let me talk you through the range. If, you, if you'd if you missed this and you're a bass player, where what are you doing? Are you living under a rock? Um, I'm sure you're just as excited as me because these things look insane. So we're celebrating 40 years of Squire, which is so cool. And I can't wait to see what they do for the 50th, because that's like a next big milestone, right? So let's go through them. I've got them up here on my screen, so I'm just going to comment about them. So we've got some 40th anniversary jazz basses and P basses here. Um, the, the theme seems to be gold, which I'm here for. We've got all... Gold pit guards look so good. We've got a, we've got all gold pit guards and gold hardware. So gold control plate, gold knobs on the P base, gold bridges, gold uh, machine heads on a Lake Placid blue P base, uh, a ruby red jazz base, a black P base, and the Olympic white jazz base. Oh, these look really, really classy. I really like the, um, that ruby red is really cool. Um, I like the Olympic, I like them all. <laughs> the black and gold is just so good looking. I am a sucker for like 50s aesthetics. So like anodized gold scratch plates are right up my alley. And you know, black and gold with a maple neck is like a dream. Um, this one doesn't have a maple neck. It's, you know, it's probably a Indian laurel fretboard. But it's got block inlays, which is cool. The only thing I don't like about these is that they've got, um, all this gold hardware, which looks really snazzy, and then they've got the perloid block inlays. I kind of wish that they'd gone for like a cream inlay to kind of match the gold a bit more, because that's the only thing that really puts me off of these. Otherwise, it's really cool. Um, £450 for those, so we'll talk about that in a bit. That's big for Squire. Um, next up is probably my favourite, uh, which is the Vintage Editions. So we've got really classic looking 50s basses. Like I said, I'm into 50s aesthetics. And one of my dream Fender basses is a vintage blonde P bass, gold pit guard, maple neck and fretboard. And Squire have done it. It's basically they've done the Ventura range, which is like the 50s inspired range in Squire. And I've always wanted them to do that because it just suits me so well. And I absolutely love it. It looks so good. The only thing I don't really like about 
those Vinteras. I've not played them, but supposedly they've got like big chunky 50s necks and it's not really for me. I'd like saying a little bit slimmer and this one's got a, com it says a comfortable C-shaped. So I'd be confident that that would be a bit easier on the old fingies to play. They've got it in the Vintage Blonde. They've got it in Dakota Red. Uh, that's it for the P bases. And then the Jazz bases, interestingly, they've got it on Seafoam Green, which I, I've now I've got the, uh, the, P, the Sire P5 in the awesome... Uh, what's it called? Mild green. It looks like a very similar color, and yeah, nice. I'm a big fan. So that looks awesome. And then they've also got like a a wide two color sunburst satin jazz base, all the same specs as the other jazz base. But yeah, really cool. It's it's like a thicker burst. You know, it says more black around the outside. That will be somebody's dream base. I don't I don't know if I've really seen one like that in the wild. So it's really interesting for them to bring something like that into the range um moving on to arguably what people are most excited for or what i'm seeing a lot of excitement for is the new contemporary active bases so they did the contemporary bases back along you know they're not um uh they're nothing new to the range um or or is there because the jazz bases have been around for a couple of years now, and they're around the four hundred pound mark. So these are double humbucking active bases from Squire, um, in really cool finishes. Originally, they just did it in matte black and matte white. Then they started bringing out some like olive ones and like a burgundy mist. Now, oh, <laughs> they've got they've nailed it. They've got a gunmetal metallic, and all with black headstocks as well. So it's so cool. This gunmetal metallic is in a five string which my god i am so so tempted by <laughs> it's so cool um i absolutely love it um they've got that and they've also got it in I can't believe i'm saying this too they've got it in a shoreline gold oh shoreline gold is like a dream color of mine as well i was so excited when i saw these announced um then we've got brand new a contemporary active p base so this is a p h configuration so we're totally we, I, have we ever seen this configuration for squire before i don't know i don't normally like five string p bases i don't know what it is i think they're i don't really like the sound of that low b but being active and with a humbucker yeah that that's cool it looks really cool they got it in this black color and then this incredible looking red as well that they had on the guitar range I'm so excited i i cannot decide what to pick up let me know reach out to me on instagram you know let me know what you want me to check out because i i cannot choose <laughs> i don't know what to do so yeah i need a bit of help um let's move on from squire because or, or before we do just talk about the price expensive these expensive for squire and I don't blame them. They're about 450 to 460 for some of these. Um, yeah, they're gonna sell. They're just gonna sell so well. Um, so they can afford to hoik the price up a bit. I really wanna check them out because I'm really interested to see if the quality controls increased. St I thought these were gonna be made in China, like the paranormal, because the quality control on that was fantastic and it was really well received. So I thought they'd be leasing more out to that factory but no they're still indonesian made and the classic vibe range i'd not really had any big issues but i've seen evidence of the issues and a lot of people online in the comment section have told me about the issues they've had so this new price point i really hope they've upped their game but yeah still super excited um moving on gretch gretch why do you do this to me gretch i thought we were friends so as you know, I am a big fan of the short scale Junior Jets Electromatic 2G22. I don't know what order you say that name. So many parts to it. Um, they're like Les Paul style short scale Gretsch, the one that Mike Kerr famously used in Royal Blood. Um, I've got it and I did a review on it and I love it. It's it's a really, really great short scale and insane for the price point. Now, I really liked the finishes as they were. The original ones we had the reds like a green black and the like the brown sunburst one that i've got they've gone and done it 
they've they've released a shell pink one guys shell pink uh bristol fog and oh, i can't remember the name of the other one but go and check it out on their website they've got some in three new finishes that all look incredible um the bristol fog one i really really like and i'm i live near a city called bristol so you know it, it feels like it's right up my alley but i can't deny that my love for the shell pink oh that's the only thing I wish Squire had done. <laughs> if they'd done a, a shell pink P base, I would have bought it there and then. <laughs> but yeah, it looks so cool. So cool. And yeah, if you're in the market for for that base, get that. <laughs> Don't bother looking at the old ones. Get one of those new ones. They look incredible. Ah, Moving on to Schecter. Um, so I might have missed this because it looks like it was a little bit of old news. These Schecter, we have got um, some new models. Uh, well, not new models. They're just new versions of models. So we've got a new Model T and a new Omen, uh, both in four and five strings. And yeah, the, the Model T, notoriously incredible. It was my third ever base, the Schecter Model T. The old, um, all, the black one, the maple neck. And yeah, incredible it's what first turned me on to Schecter and I have no doubt that these would sound insane I would love one <laughs> I would really like one there but they are like 1130 pounds so maybe not they have got the omens though for 600 pounds four and a five string best looking omens I think I've seen really a bit more stripped back looking with like a almost like a flame maple uh transparent white finish on there um yeah really cool Go and check those out. Um, gosh, so much things to get through. I'm just scrolling through Anderton's at the minute to see what new stuff is here as well. Um, see if I missed anything. Oh yeah, we've got new Charvels, the the San Dimas. Um, new colours in that, in like a platinum pearl and a black. So not really that exciting, but I feel like they really need to they really need to do something special with that base because it's been through the ringer a bit like a lobster didn't like his it's noisy it was just bad quality for the price you know they were over a thousand pounds and and they're about they're just under a thousand pounds these new ones but um, I'm, I'm not that excited about these and i can't say i'll be picking one up just based on the based get it just based on the reputation alone but anyway um, Jackson have also released some new bases. We've got a couple of new Spectras in different colours, um, and then also the con the series, the sorry, the X series concert base CBXNTDX. <laughs> What's wrong with these names? Basically, the Jackson Rickenbacker P base thing monstrosity. They've got it in black. They've got it in Snow White now as well, and both in five strings. Now, if it didn't look ugly enough before, it, it looks even worse now. <laughs> oh, gosh. One thing I do appreciate, though, looking at it, is that they've done that thing with a five-string P-Base where they've almost, they've, because you know when the five-string P-Base is, because it's a split coil in there, they look a bit weird because you've got one long pickup and then a shorter pickup. I wish all five-string P-Bases would do this. They've got a, like a fake added length to the, to the, pickup that's on the lower strings to make it look even i really appreciate that but yeah no <laughs> still not doing it for me sorry jackson no good so so let's move out of the world let's move out of this world let's move out of the world of guitars and move into pedals and amps now fender have launched some new pedals mm, not really much to talk about though i don't think there's None like bass specific looking ones. They're all just generic, which doesn't mean that they won't work on bass, but I don't know. I, I'm always a bit wary of pedals that aren't specifically for bass, but there are companies like um, Earthquaker Devices, you know, and uh, Way Huge that don't do bass specific ones. And that's fine. I'm sure these are fine too, but they just look a bit cheap, these pedals. It's like, Here's an overdrive. Here's a reverb. Here's a delay. It's like all the staples in a new series. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not that jazzed about these. Um, but what I am jazzed about is the next announcement, which has happened just this week. Um, Dark Glass 
They've been teasing for a, a short amount of time now uh, something called the E500. I'm like, what is this? And there were sounds of like delay and reverb going on. And I was like, is this like a multi effects? And I thought, are they really going to stomp on their own, tread on like their own ground of like the quad cortex? Are, are they going to do that? That seems a bit weird. Um, kind of, but not really. The Exponent 500, Exponent, ex, Exponent, expo, Exponent, we're going to call it that. 500 is a 500 watt clean amp from Dark Glass. First time we've ever seen this. Normally it's like a, a real dirty amp, you know, mixed in with their different circuits of the Alpha Omega or the B7K, you know, or the micro tube circuit. But this is a completely clean amp with built in effects. So we've got so much. We've got delays, reverbs, flanges, chorus, uh, compressors, noise suppressors, distortion, of course, uh, you know, all the effects you could want all in one 500 watt head unit. So it can power a cab. You've got everything all in one. Really, really like this product. It looks really cool. Go and check out Patrick Hunter's video on it. Great demo. Of course, I will sing Patrick's praises to the end of the earth. Um, yeah, go and check out that video to hear what it sounds like. My thoughts on this when it initially released was, oh, this is cool. Oh no, am I going to have to sell all of my stuff to afford this? Because <laughs> it's about a thousand pounds, which isn't too bad, I suppose, considering what it is. But when you look at like the Line 6 HX Stomp, where you can get everything and more all in one, but it doesn't power anything. So it's it's kind of push and pull really it's give and take swings and roundabouts and all that jazz i think this is a really cool product and i think it will sell really well um and it's so tiny it's so cute and small um one thing that i don't like too much about it so it's so backpedaling a little bit pedaling get it it's it's all controlled via an app and via Bluetooth. So you go on your phone and you can edit your effects on there. And then you can map out all of your parameters and the controls to the knobs that are on the um on the on the unit. So it's all like A, B, C, D, E, I think. And then you can map what you control on there. Now, I know that I would get totally bogged down and confused with that. I'm quite a tactile person, like to do things on the fly. Um, I, I don't love the idea of having to rely on my phone or, or an app um, and like just having the unit if I'm like oh, I just want to turn this up a minute I'd have to go wait what, what's this knob doing I'll have to check the app uh, okay all right it's that okay you know for me that's a that's a really unattractive but it does sound cool and I really love Dark Glass purely for their innovation and pushing the industry forward because they are innovators like that you, you can't deny it they're, they're big players in the industry doing great things um what else is there to say about this thing oh yeah so originally i was a bit concerned that you couldn't control this via a pedal i was like what's the point in this if you've got to like tap your phone mid mid song um but you can hook it up to a midi controller so if you've got like a blank one you can you can assign presets up to it i think you can do five presets so it's it seems like it can do so much but then also so little at the same time um but yeah i i would i would love to try one and dark glass um please let's do this <laughs> Okie dokie, uh, that is everything for the news. That is a long news section and thank you for sticking with me <laughs> so much. And I'm sure it's going to keep on coming and keep coming and keep coming over the over the next couple of weeks. Oh, I've probably missed something already and something's been announced. Goodness sake. Let's move on to our next question. Okay. My good friend Tobias Faulkner has asked on Instagram, says, favorite tuning to play in and why? Plus, what gauge and brand of strings would you ideally use? So I had a bit of a weird, um, like, realization recently, of, or I think why I like a certain tuning that I like playing in. Um, so my standard favorite strings you know I'm a pretty I'm a pretty simple guy if I'm playing an E standard I like a 100 to 45 so I like it to be a little bit even though I, I like attack those strings with some aggression I kind of like the ability to bend a bit more and just the feeling of a, a set of 100s 
I, I'll, you know, I'll go back and forth between 100s and 105s, but yeah, well, I've recently I've been really into 100s. I like that feeling. Um, that being said, what I have been enjoying doing recently, I, I was in a Nirvana tribute band uh, recently, which just for one gig, which didn't end up going ahead because of the big C, um, COVID, by the way, no, nothing else, don't worry. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and we were tuning half a step down for that. So I normally play in drop D. This was half a step tuned down from drop D, which is like E, what, E flat standard, but with the D tuned down to D flat. I don't know the name of tunings. You know, I'm not a musical person. Um, but yeah, and I love that tuning. I love that tuning. I think when I've got a set of 105s, when it's tuned down half a step, I kind of get the same feeling like I'm playing a set of 100s. So my chosen um, tuning would be uh, the E, f uh, drop, well, drop, what would that be? Drop, drop D flat, <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Um, so E flat standard, then tuning the, the E string down to a, a D flat, and then with a set of 105s on there, just because it gives it this bit slacker feeling and I think I know why I like that tuning I think it's because you know normally when I pick up a bass and I and I, the notes that I play are normally like around a three and a five and the opens and things like that just naturally um, and so when you tune half a step down it almost unlocks all these other notes in your head that you wouldn't normally play so much so everything sounds a bit different and a bit cooler and you think like oh that chord progression sounds great and you're like oh wait this is just like it's just the normal notes that I play. Like, why does it sound different? And that might just be me and it might be being an idiot. There might be more of an explanation for that. But that's the kind of impression that I always get. And I don't know, I really like that. And it kind of, I always find if I'm struggling to write something or, you know, come be creative, changing tuning is a great way of doing that because it just naturally unlocks all these different sounds in your head, which is a weird phenomenon, I'm sure. But uh, yeah. I, I think that's my favorite tuning um, and string gauge really. So if I'm playing standard tuning, it'll be a set of 100s. If I'm tuning down a little bit, even just half a step, we'll go to 105s. Really nice. Um, and what brand of string? So my string journey continues. And normally I'd say Diodario Pro Steels, really bright sounding like piano-like attack to those strings and they last a long time. But recently, when I've been getting some new basses in, and I've been think I've been playing them, I've gone, God, I really like the strings on these. What are they? Oh, they're Ernie Balls. And I like stopped playing Ernie Balls years ago because they didn't last very long. And I just like, I don't know, I wasn't that blown away by them when they were new on the bass. But uh, I've been getting back into them, you know. Like I I've had some time away, and now I just realise how how good they actually are and how good they sound so yeah i'm i'm getting back into ernie balls i'm trying some different strings based when patrick hunter was on the podcast he recommended the cobalts so i've got a set of those now so yeah i'm excited to continue my journey and uh yeah check it let's check in next time and see where i'm at with that um thank you so much for the question let us move on to the next section <coughs> So this is my favorite section of the podcast, I think, because it's called That Tone You Own. Every week, I ask our guests to bring along a tone of theirs that they consider to be like their signature sound or a sound that they're playing recently that they really enjoy. And that's what I'm doing this week. I'm bringing along a, a bit of a sneak peek tone for you, uh, lucky podcast listeners, because... It's been, I says it's been very busy times recently because I've had the, the Sire P5 and the D5 arrive recently and I'm sure you've seen because I've been absolutely rinsing them for content online. Um, I say rinsing, I mean like getting loads of content out of them, not rinsing Sire, um, which I was doing previously. Um, anyway, so sneak peek. They, I've been putting lots of effort into these reviews and... Uh, the P5 review came out last week and next week will be the D5. And 
that's what I've got in my hands right now. And I'm gonna give you just a sneak peek of, of what this thing sounds like. You might have heard it in my unboxing or I did a little demo, but I'm gonna dive into a little bit more about it here and talk about what I feel like a couple of weeks into owning it now. Um, so yeah, this is it going through the Line 6 HX Stomp. For this demo, I'm gonna do the Aguilar Tone Hammer head with the Ampeg 810 cap. So tone all the way on, volume all the way up. There's only one pickup. Um, I should probably explain what this is if you don't know. It's like a 50s style P bass. So it's your standard non-split coil pickup. Um, but this one has a few secrets up its sleeve, which you have to wait for the review to hear about. But this is it, tone all the way on. It sounds a bit... I think it sounds more raw and untamed compared to the P5. Um, that makes sense because it's like a a more primitive version of the P bass. And you definitely get that vibe and feel from the sound of this bass. But at the same time, it's got some really modern features as well. It's not like a slab body. It's got belly cuts, roasted maple neck, roll fingerboard edges. You know, and the the hum cancelling pickup because you know these style of pickups are notoriously noisy, and so they've really done great things here, sire, um, to retain that vintage feel and sound whilst making it modern and a, a proper gigable, tourable, recordable instrument. You know, let's let's dive into it some more. Sounds great, whatever you play on it. Let's play with it with a bit of bit of pick action now. I think it honestly sounds the best with a pick. Um, it just sounds, like I said, untamed. Um, well, I think one of the shining star sounds of this bass is let's roll off the tone. Let's do it. Let's go 50% first. Bit of uh, let's do finger style with it fully on. Roll it off 50%. Honestly, I think that is like a sweet spot because it's, although it's like raw and cool sounding, it's, it's very high output. And, you know, my settings on the amp are not like treble heavy at all. Um, so I think this really helps to tame it a little bit. Um, let's roll off the tone all the way. I honestly think, and like, I never thought I'd say this about a bass because <laughs> I watched back my old, like, my first Squire classic vibe 60s P bass review the other day, and I was like, who wants to hear it with the tone off? No one wants that. <laughs> and I was very young and naive. Um, and like this bass, like I think it sounds way better with the tone rolled off or like halfway rather than full. Um, it suits the vibe and yeah, it just inspires you differently, you know, it hits differently. <laughs> Stay tuned for the full review of this bad boy. We can hear even more tones and such. I think this is a really cool bass. I cannot wait to put some flats on it. I think that will like help deaden the sound even more and it will just really suit this. I think when you've got like a dead sound with a really raw sounding pickup, it helps to give it loads of character when you've got the tone off. And I think that really, really helps. And I really like that sound. So 
yeah, I'll be diving into it more in my review. Stay tuned. Hit subscribe and notification bell, etc. So you can uh, so you bloody get notified when it comes out. Let's move on to the next segment. Okay, it's time for the big base debate. So for this section, I take one of your questions that have been submitted for the week and just like to make it into the topic for the week. So this week, the question is from Michael on Instagram, who asks, is Fender finally feeling the flames at their feet? I, I mean, that's, you know, an incredibly composed bit of alliteration there. Oh. Um, continuing with the question, are we about to be treated to a price and quality re-evaluation? So I think this is a really interesting question with, <clears throat> oh gosh, with the launch of the Squire range, because we're already seeing a, a price hike, you know, it's going up. Um, and yeah, I think they are. Honestly, I think they are. And I think they do need to reevaluate a few things. I always think Fender are in a bit of a funny place in their career um, because it's they're kind of damned if they do, damned if they don't in a way. Um, they could keep things the same and they would still sell really well. Or they could change it up and still sell really well. But public perception is kind of really not dwindling on Fender, but it's people are, are just upset whatever they do. Because if they bring out something new and modern and, and interesting and innovative, people are like, no, no, thank you. Don't like this. Doesn't work. Just do what you know. Stick to what you know, you know. And then if they bring out like uh, some 50s or 60s reissue, uh, rehash that they do like every single year, people are like, oh, yawn. This is just the same thing again. And you're like, oh, for goodness sake, let let them breathe, let them let them just try something. So that's why I was excited to um, see the Player Plus series because although it's nothing, you know, groundbreaking, it's still something different that they haven't done before. Um, and that's honestly why I think Squire is just a much more exciting brand because they can almost afford to do more interesting things. Um, but are they feeling the flames at their feet, Fender? I think they should be. I think they should be. All you need to do is look at brands like Sire. They're starting to, you know, four hundred pounds or under four hundred pounds for the for the new P5 and D5 and V5, the passive range. And originally, I thought, oh wow, they're really going after the Squire market here. They're really trying to um, pinch pinch that audience. And that's until I got one. Uh, I've got the P5 and the D5. The P5 review is out now. The D5, you know I've got because you would have just heard it a minute ago. Um, but those bases are incredible for the price. Like, not even just for the price. I always say that. And I think, well, no, because that's like diminishing their value a bit. And just saying, yeah, they're all right for that money. No, they're just fantastic bases anyway. I'd expect that to be like at least... 800 pounds you know it's ha it's under half that price and looking at the features and the feel and the quality of it it is madness and i think it's companies like that that are really going to put the pressure on brands like fender because they need to step it up like i said i thought they were going after the squire market but honestly with the quality and that insane price point they're going after the, the mexican fender market you know i've had a lot of people asking should i go for the fender or should i go for the sire or people saying i've just bought the player series and now i've heard this and now i want this you know so i think it's very smart price point for sire and i don't know how they do it but insane absolutely insane considering like the size of company that fender is as well you think they'd be able to afford to uh drop the price point a bit but you know they are they're just coasting and they are relying on brand alone. And the name on the headstock is having more and more impact on the price of something, regardless of the quality, you know, um, and where it's made. Because I, I don't really care where a base is made, to be honest. It gets a bit of a, like a uh, territory when you start thinking about like how much people are paid and whether that's fair, you know. But in terms of just stripping it back and talking about the, the guitars themselves... I, I don't think country manufacture matters too much, you know, at different price points. If you, there's a 400, 500 pound base made in Indonesia, that is going to be a, 
like the equivalent of like an 800 to a thousand pound base i think that's just made in a different country um so yeah that that's just my opinion anyway i'm sure i know people have strong opinions about that kind of thing but i think fender it will get to a point where these brands are massively outselling them and they can't just keep relying on their brand name um but I think we're a long way off of that. So in terms of a price quality reevaluation, kind of no, I don't, I think we're a couple of years away, but at the same time, I say no, but it's kind of already happening as well because we're already seeing prices go up, you know, just due to the cost of manufacturing and shipping and all of that, you know, and, and shortages of wood and logistical issues, you know, that hikes the price up big time um so we're already seeing that uh you know those squires i mentioned they're creeping up into the 400 pound mark and people are not happy about it you know they're saying like this is ridiculous that's why i really hope that the quality is upped as well and honestly i think fender particularly in the like mexican range i think they need to improve the quality as well because i think that the squire classic vibe stuff whilst the quality control is sometimes a bit of a an issue which is why i always recommend trying it in a shop i do think that if you had two perfectly well made ones the squire comes out on top for me when i compared them in the shop i just preferred the feel of it i thought it felt like better and just nicer than the neck is like one of the most important things and it just felt so much nicer on the squire i thought so i think yeah, they're just Fender at the minute, relying on their name and how long... The question is, how long can they last with that alone? And I'm excited to... You know, I have nothing against Fender. I say all this stuff, but I love Fender. I'm a Fender lover. And uh, I can't wait to see what else they do. But yeah, we, we could get a re-evaluation. Um, but it's just about what other brands are out there that can put the pressure on. And, you know, even brands like Harley Benton... Now, whilst I, Harley Benton are an interesting one because I don't really feel like they're a competitor for Fender because they're kind of different markets at this point and the different price points. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope that they do feel the flames at their feet. I do because it just drives competition and there's nothing wrong with that because for the consumer, that's great because we get all this new, cool, innovative stuff. And us bass players often miss out on that kind of things, you know. So I want to see more brands competing for that price point and really, uh, really forcing Fender to compete. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered that question. <laughs> Who knows? But it's an interesting talking point anyway. And I love looking at the industry as a whole and seeing how people react to one another because you know there are definitely trends that people go after like at the minute it's roasted maple when are we gonna we're starting to get roasted maple squires when are fender gonna do it they do fender necks that you can just buy roasted but not really on many production models so when are we gonna see that for instance you know and that when like this is a prime example when fender do that that is gonna be like huge price increase for that bass because it will be many people's like dream bass like oh, i love fender but i love these roasted maple necks <gasps> they've launched one oh great perfect for me you know it's going to be expensive i think when they finally do it it's almost like they're late to the game but because of their brand name they can you know afford to to do it as this big launch and a big wow look at this um on that guitar so yeah don't know if any of this answers it, but I love talking about this kind of stuff. Oh, so, enough of me talking. I'm sure you can now go about your day and do whatever you want. But if you are going to do something in your day and do whatever you want, hit that like and subscribe button on the YouTubes. If you're listening to something to this on something like Spotify, leave a review and go and follow me on Instagram and reach out. I Like I said at the start, absolutely love talking to people on there. So, that's also where I post all of my podcast questions. So feel free to keep updated with my stories, interact, get involved, and yeah, let's 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 chat. I'm I'm excited to talk to you. Ah, I think that's everything for this week. Once again, thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.